Well, good morning, everybody. Can I say Happy New Year? Yeah, Happy New Year. Very good. Excited for the new year. I'm wondering, what would, what would it take for 2024 to be really great for you? It's time to start thinking about that, right? I mean, today's kind of the, the, the day where we naturally and rightfully look back on this last year, and then we start thinking about the new year. And maybe this last year has been really great for you. Maybe you've grown and become a different person, or maybe it's been a real challenge. Maybe this year's been like struggle with a capital S. It's time to reflect, you know, how has this year been? And then into the new year, what would the new year, and what would make the new year great? And one question I think about, I would pose to you is, do you wanna be different a year from now than you are today? You know, what would it take to be a little bit different? And in what areas would you wanna be different would you want to change? It, wouldn't it be a shame if an entire year went by and a human being didn't change? And maybe you know somebody like that. You know, the ones that I think of, usually what's because of uh, circumstances or because of, of a bad year or several bad years, they find themselves to be in a real dark place, maybe really bitter and stuck in their ways. And more than stuck in their ways, just stuck. And a year can go by and not change. I think you can agree with me, it's tragic when a human being doesn't grow, doesn't change. God's created us to know him and to love him and just knowing him and loving him and being loved by him, there's change available for all of us. There's grace available for all of us. So today I want us to think about, and next week too, I hope you'll come next week, uh, we're gonna talk about these next steps and when I think about the new year, of course, I think about how can I grow in Christ? How can I become more uh, closer walking with Jesus? How can I trust him more? Uh, Jesus, in Matthew 22, there's the text, uh, a good one to think about when he was asked by this uh, religious leader, teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? This is Matthew 22. 34, 36 and following, having asked that question, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. This is the greatest commandment we call it. And the second is like it. So the greatest is to love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, right? All that you are to love God. If you were to follow that greatest commandment as said by Jesus, it's gonna mean growth for you. You're gonna, you're gonna focus your attention, your, your adoration on God, and it's gonna mean growth. And to love your neighbor as you love yourself. For some of us here, maybe the, the great goal, the great change, the growth we need to experience is to love ourselves more. That could be going into the new year. It's like, I'm so critical of myself. And they say, you know, most all of our self-talk is critical. I mean, a large percentage of it. Maybe for you, it's like, I need to love myself more. And, and I would say, yes, please do, because as you are able to love yourself, you're able to love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't like yourself very much, what does that mean for your neighbor? Your neighbor's in trouble. So for the sake of your own heart, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, love yourself deeply so that you can love others and love God. And the way to find yourself, you know, loving yourself more is to receive this great love of God. When you think about all that he has done for you, when you think about how cherished you are, how you've been adopted into God's family, this perfect heavenly father, you, you, you'll begin to appreciate just how valuable you are. And the bulletin, I hope you got one of these. You know, the, we change the outside from series to series, but the rest of it's pretty much the same. Some have commented, it's like, why do you give these to me? Nothing changes. Well, if you're a member of the church family here, if you're, if you're here, well, the, the shell really isn't for you, except maybe it is for you, and I'll explain that in a minute. On the back side is uh, this little section, two sections. The top is how we follow Jesus. And as you think about this new year and what would make 2024 great, following Jesus would make it great. 
And to review and to think about this discipleship pathway, I give it to you and say, when we talk about next steps, all of these things that we talk about, there are next steps available to us because it is a discipleship pathway. It's a way to love God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. As we grow as followers of Jesus, right, we become more beautiful images of Christ walking around on earth. And that's what God's called us to do. You know God's agenda for you is to make you into the very image of Jesus? Anybody there yet? I mean, if, you're, if you are already in the image of Jesus, please raise your hand and keep on going. <laughs> none of us are perfect, none of us are there yet. It's this opportunity a year from now to be more like Jesus than we are today. Are you, are you willing to do that? Are you up for that? Um, Jesus said to go and make disciples, and our discipleship pathway is just how we think about what making disciples look like. And so for us, with our faith in the faithfulness of Jesus, saving our soul, these four categories that we talk about describe the big buckets of the things that we actually do. Our faith is in Jesus, it's a finished work, and now we follow him. And since there is, it is a pathway, there are next steps, we are to take next steps, we're not to be idle, we're not to be stagnant. Do you find yourself a little stagnant these days? We're to be in motion. Following Jesus is active in this world. If we don't take next steps in following Jesus, I mean, even think of the phrase, I am following Jesus. What does that mean? Jesus is in motion. And the life of a disciple is one of following Jesus. The life of a disciple is one of being in motion. And if you're stagnant, if you're idle, then without repentance in your life, you could turn around one day and say, where did, where did Jesus go? Where did he go? He's in motion. If you're stagnant, not taking next steps and following him, you can look around, where is he? And usually that re- looks like some sin, some uh, travesty, some horrible thing. All of a sudden you wake up like, what just happened to me? What happened to me? What did I just do? And where is Jesus? Now, repentance is a beautiful thing because in that moment, if you repent, say, Lord, where are you? You turn in his direction, and guess what? He's closer than a brother. He is as close as your very breath. And the humility of heart in repentance means he's right there. And you know what he says to us? I love you. You're forgiven. My grace is real. Let's go. Follow me. That's what he said to his disciples, right? Come follow me. I will make you fishers of men. So this life of a disciple is a life in motion. We're moving, we're growing, we're following Jesus. So what are your next steps? What are some next steps for you? I don't know your next steps, but I have a, I have a top 10 list this week and next. I created a top 10 list of next steps for disciples of Jesus. And if you want to grow as a follower of Christ, you want to develop as a person, if you want to be more like Christ a year from now than you are today, then at least one of these, if not all 10 of them, will be things that will resonate with you. Because they are things as we step into into them, as we follow Jesus in them, spiritual growth, development, We become better people because we're becoming more like Jesus. And they just build on each other, and it's a beautiful thing. So if you have your pencil, note page, you can take take some notes. Uh, So we'll do five today. Maybe I'll slip into a sixth one, and we'll do the rest next week. The first next step for some of you may be this. Be baptized into Christ. If you've come to faith in Jesus, if you believe that he is who he said he is, God's son, uh, a next step for you would be to be baptized into Christ. Um, If you believe in his faithfulness and his accomplished work on on the cross, rather, then be identified with Christ like Romans 6 talks about. Write Romans 6 down if you want to 
I think God's thoughts about baptism and what it means, Romans chapter six. Be baptized into Christ publicly. It's a beautiful moment. It's a public moment. You, you know, scripture talks about how we, our sins are washed away and we receive, like we talked about a couple weeks ago, or no, just last week, we talked about how we receive the Holy Spirit as a gift. This is what's promised at your baptism. In Acts 2, 36, you know, that, that great day, Acts chapter 2, and Peter had just preached that first gospel sermon, and the text tells us that, uh, you know, he kind of he kind of climaxes it with this. He says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, they were pierced to the heart. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, this great, great question, brothers, what shall we do? It's, it's the great question. When you come to faith in Jesus, there's always... Like, there, I just know there's a next step. I know there is, must be some way for me to respond. There must be something that I can do. And this was their question in Acts 2. Brothers, what, can, what, what should we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. There's something going on in the water. There's something magnificent and uh, heavenly and if you've been baptized, you know what I'm talking about, where you're, where you're identified with Jesus in his death, his burial, his resurrection, and when we die to ourselves, we're buried in that, in that grave, that watery grave. We raise to walk a new life. It feels like eternity. It feels like resurrection. And he says it's the, forg it's, it's the forgiveness of sins. It's saying my sins are no longer being held against me because of what Christ has done. And, verse 30, 38, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, God's very presence with you. God's with you, but your baptism is a place where it's like there's, there, there remains no doubt that you are an adopted child of God and he is your heavenly father. So maybe for you, going into the new year, your next step is to be baptized into Christ. We, we have some water right here and it's very cold. So today, today might be your day. You'll, I didn't bring anything to get, that's all right. You'll, you'll go home sopping wet, freezing. There may be icicles by the time you get home, but it'll be the best day of your life because you said, I, I, I belong to Jesus. Be baptized into Christ. That could be your next step. The second one is, this is the next step, worship in person weekly. And I just want to say this. If you're, if you're not traveling and you're not sick, going into the new year, just commit to being in worship with God's family corporately on a weekly basis. If you are traveling, if you are sick, I mean, if you're sick, please stay home, right? Sometimes we have to tell parents, this includes your children, you know? <laughs> if your children are, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Please come back. Please come back. <laughs> I know. I love children. Uh, if you are sick, you know, of course, we're blessed to have Narkenzie online, and you can watch on YouTube or Facebook, and we encourage you to do that just so you can, like next week, maybe you're sick next week. Don't you want to know what the last five next steps are? I bet you will. If you're sick, you can, you know, you can uh, find it, or even later in the week, it's there for you. So stay connected that way. But if you're, like, reasonably well, like, just commit to being in person weekly. You know, the scripture in Hebrews 10 rings true, right? Where the Hebrew writer says, let us consider how we may spur, that's a great word, how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, uh, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Some of you have commented, it's like, are these the last days? It feels like these might be the last days. As, as you see the day approaching, what are we encouraged to do? We need to spur one another on to love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, because the only way to spur one another on is actually to be together. If you're alone, if you're isolated, you have nobody in your life that you can spur on, 
and nobody that's spurring you on. And so the meeting together, Christ followers have always gathered together. The ecclesia, you know, the church of God, the gathering ones of God. We've, we are a people that are together. So just a next step maybe, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in church. You know, for me growing up, and I'm grateful to my parents for this, it was never, are we going to church tomorrow? On a Saturday night, right? It was never, are we going to church? It was always, what time is breakfast so we can get there on time? And that was instilled in me. And I know it's not instilled in everybody. It may not be instilled in you either. And the trends, right, as we, as we are living as Christ followers in an ever-increasing secular culture that is not believing the things of the gospel and actually is hostile to the things of God, we see it happening. Even the most dedicated Christ followers are finding themselves attending corporate gatherings less and less and less and less. And I just think as a church, we need to stand against that trend and not say it's okay. I'm glad we have Norkenzie online. I really am. It served us this year so much. But we are a people that gather together to spur one another on to love and good deeds. Let's be those people. It's going to take a little bit of a mental shift, I understand. This may not be you, but some people wake up Sunday morning and the conversation in bed is, should I go to church today? Of course, sometimes the bed wins, right? That pillow is pretty magnetic and it's like, you know. Uh, Oh, I don't know. I've had a good week. I, I'm really fine. I'm okay. You know, I, I don't, I'll catch, I'll catch the sermon Thursday. Uh, and I just want to encourage us to have a mental, so if you're going to take this next step, have a mental change. The mental change, the, the shift in our hearts need, needs to go from, you know, I don't, I don't need to go today. There's no one that I need to see. I'm good. The switch to, there's someone that probably needs to see me today. There's somebody that I can encourage. And if I don't go, I may not be able to encourage them. And you might be thinking, well, I'm not very good at encouraging. Listen, your very presence is an encouragement baseline. And then as you greet people, greet one another, as you share a cup of coffee, as you check in with somebody you haven't seen in a couple weeks maybe, if you've been praying for somebody and you say, hey, I've been praying for you, do you understand just your mere presence and mine is a great encouragement to the body of Christ? And, it, and your presence is spurring us on. Living in this world is tough. Just being together reminds us the kingdom of heaven on earth is real. It's a real thing. And I have real brothers and sisters in Christ. And here's the, here's the thing that maybe a lot of you probably know. When you spend a few minutes encouraging somebody else, guess who goes home encouraged? I am not kidding. It's really miraculous. It's of the Lord. Where you expend yourself Encouraging someone else, you find yourself laughing, you know, you, you're in, but you're, in, you're encouraging one another and you go home encouraged. I came today, I didn't need any encouragement, but man, am I encouraged. Why? It's the kingdom of heaven among us. It's the Holy Spirit dwelling among us. He inhabits our praises. He inhabits our fellowship. If you're here and you're healthy, boy, just be in person. And many of you know, you know, the whole COVID thing happened, and it was so fun for me. You know, this conversation would come up every once in a while as we were coming back together in corporate worship, right? And everybody was so grateful for Nurkenzie Online, me too. But coming back in the room, the comment was, it's palpably better here. It's, it's like different. I mean, it was good, but it's, yes. And I have no other explanation except the Holy Spirit of God dwells among his people. He is with you wherever you go, but when we gather together, there's something electric of the Spirit that happens. So just be here. Don't miss it. And if you are doing well, great. Come and share this blessing and encourage one of us. So that could be a step for you. The, th the third step and I know I'm shifting gears here, but just keep up, all right? The third is this. Read the Bible devotionally. 
If, if I could give every person a habit, it would be this. Just to be a person of God's word. You know, on Christmas Day, we read, if you're, and we have life journals. One of the things you can pick up when you go is a life journal. Uh, we also have a group on the Bible app. And um, so, in fact, if we want to jump to that slide, we already have a group for next year. And if you click this little QR code, you can like join our group. You'll need a Bible app, a smartphone with a Bible app. Yeah, but if you want to read, have devotions with, the, with many of the rest of us, I just invite you to do that. So we are reading on Christmas Day in 1 John. All five chapters of 1 John doesn't take very long, 15, 20 minutes. And... And boy, what a great letter in the Bible to read on Christmas Day. It talks about the love of God, and it talks about how there is absolutely a different worldview. In chapter 4, verse 5, there's a whole different worldview that people attain to, but not so in the kingdom of heaven. And you read in 1 John on Christmas, um, like in chapter 3, and what's happening is when you read the Bible devotionally, God's thoughts are coming into your mind by the power of the Holy Spirit who's been given to you as a gift because you belong to him. And you read his word and his thoughts enter your mind. Where else are you gonna have these ideas? 1 John 3, verse seven and eight. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. You know that's why Jesus came? The devil is like after you and me because we are so loved by God. He's already lost, but he's coming after us because we've been created in the image of God and being recreated you know, into the image of Jesus. And so he's coming after us. And our, and our flesh, I mean, we're, often we're easy pickings for the evil one, but Jesus came to destroy the devil's work. Go on to verse 13. Uh, John writes, Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. We've passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Right? Go down to verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Where else are you going to hear these things? Hopefully you'll hear them in church as we gather together week after week. You'll hear the gospel proclaimed. You'll be able to encourage one another with these words. But one day a week is not enough. Studies have said if, uh, if, a, if a Christ follower will open this book and read just a few minutes every day, four days a week, there is, there's something happens from three days to four days. It's like an exponential kind of growth curve where your, your mind and your heart begins to be changed into the image of Jesus. You become different and God's changing you from the inside out. It's the power of the Holy Spirit being deposited, you know, his ideas being deposited into your mind, ideas that you will hear nowhere else except in his kingdom. And we need his word more than a half an hour on Sundays. Do you agree? So how can you incorporate, this may be the next step for you. This may be the next step for you. How can I read God's word devotionally? Now, I say devotionally because we often, you know, I'm going to go to a Bible study and I'm going to, I'm really going to study, uh, you know, Leviticus. Uh. <laughs> and, and I'm like, I am praying for you, brother. You know, I mean, I just am. There's, there's a lot of richness in Leviticus, but what we need is the breadth of God's word read devotionally, and oftentimes these real intense Bible studies kind of miss the love that God has for us and the love that we need to have for God. And when you're just sitting at the Lord's feet, listening and learning from him, you know, journaling, is, if you're led to do that, thinking his thoughts, it's devotion. We talk about growing in our devotion to Jesus. 
Because this is not a religion. This is a relationship with God Almighty through Jesus Christ. And he loves us. He loves us. And we get to love him in return. It's not a list of do's. You don't read this book for all the lists of do's and don'ts. And Leviticus is full of them, for sure. You read it to hear God's heart for you, to know how much he loves you, and he does. So read the Bible devotionally. Join us, you know, join us in reading through the Life Journal reading. It's the best reading schedule that I've ever found. Uh, We read through the Old Testament once in the year and through the New Testament twice, actually. And the way that it's put together, you don't have to wait till August to read the words of Jesus. It's the way that it's put together is just wonderfully made. And so we would offer that to you if you want to take this next step and grow in Jesus. And a year from now, you'll be different. You'll be different. His thoughts in your idea, in your mind, will change your life. Uh, the fourth next step, right, is this is a, this is a close sign. Well, I don't know. This may be the one I would want to give to everybody too. It's develop a prayer habit. Develop a prayer habit. Since we're not talking about religion and we're talking about a relationship, prayer is how we talk with this one in whom we're in, uh, in love with, this one we're in relationship with. Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. And so prayer is the way to talk with God. Still in 1 John, in 1 John chapter 5, uh, 13, John writes, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that he hears us. We know that if he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've asked of him. God hears us. When we pray in Jesus' name, God Almighty, holy God, who does not, cannot coexist with sin, he hears us as we pray in Jesus' name. We're his children. He loves us. To develop a prayer habit, I mean, um, you know, to, to live a life that's not a, a prayer, I mean, how, how much of 2024 do you want to do without Jesus, really? Or would you rather be led by him, follow him, walk with him? How do you do this? Generate some habits, you know. Uh, every Sunday in worship, we have time of prayer, and you can, you, know, you can look forward to a time in corporate worship where the body of Christ is praying in Jesus' name, and we know that he hears us. He's among us. He's here. You can bring whatever request you have. There's nothing too small or insignificant. God loves us. He cares about us. Uh, you can have dedicated times of prayer. You know, when we talk about having devotions, reading the Bible, boy, prayer is such a natural thing. It, we're, we're just led into prayer. In fact, part of the Life Journal acrostic is that we end, there's an acrostic called SOAP. You can journal the SOAP, scripture, observation of what you just read. A stands for application to your life. And then the P stands for, guess what? Prayer. And you can write out a sentence or a page of prayer to God according to what you had. Some of the most significant prayer times can be found in those moments when you say, this is my time I'm gonna spend with Jesus. As a church family, we have a day of prayer. Anybody know what the date is on the day of prayer? Have you caught that yet? It's, what day is it on? It's on, the, it's on the 29th, thank you very much. And, and corporately, together, separately, because the 29th falls on all kinds of different days, one of seven, actually. Um, <laughs> you can take the prayer list for the church and also you know, the larger body of Christ in Lane County, we have, we have 10 sectors and they all have their own team and they've generated this month uh, like fresh needed prayer requests and to pray at a dedicated time like on the 29th, you can grow as a person of prayer and be a person who stands in the gap for people in our community that really need Jesus and pray blessing over this place in which we live. This happens as you develop prayer. And then, of course, you can, have, well, you can have dedicated times of prayer. You can also, because of Christ, you can pray all the time. 
There's not a moment of the day where you can't approach God in Jesus' name and knows that he hears you. I love how Paul wrote it to the Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians 5.16, he says, Rejoice always. Pray. How often? Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. It gets better. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for you. If you were to ask God, God, what's, what's your will for me in 2024? What would you want me to be and be like? Scripture tells us here's just one place to be a person of rejoicing. You don't know the circumstances of my life, though. You don't know what's going on. Days are tough these days. Yep. For most of us, we can say it's true. Days are tough. And yet, because of Jesus, we can rejoice always. And because of Jesus, we can pray continually. The Holy Spirit's been given to us as a gift. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is with us. We can talk with him right now. And we can give thanks in all the circumstances because God is victorious ultimately, and he is with us. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So be a person of prayer. We talk about we pray first and often because apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. So we pray first. We pray all the time. We pray often because we need Jesus. It's a reference to John 15, 5, where Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. There's no thing you can do. And yet with him, we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Philippians 4.13. So walk in this relationship. What would it look like for you to walk in closer relationship with Jesus this coming year? And maybe this isn't your next step, or maybe it is to develop the habit of prayer where you have dedicated times, but you also just find yourself at the oddest of times talking with your Father in heaven in Jesus' name by his Spirit. I've got one more for you. Uh, last one, the next step that we all need to be reminded of because it's easy for us to forget. Not that we ever don't know this, but we just seem to forget or maybe we're intimidated. But the next step is to share Jesus with another person. Maybe for you, maybe for all of us, the step we need to take is to share Christ with a, a person or that person who has yet to say, yeah, I will follow Jesus with you, who has yet to be adopted into his family, who's been putting Christ off, or maybe just doesn't even know that there is a Messiah in Jesus. You know, the church, our, our existence is over this. I mean, the reason that the church is here is for this. Jesus said in Luke 19, uh, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Luke 19.10. And what he does is he invites all of us to join in on this mission. And since that's what he's about, loving people, seeking and saving the lost, and he's inviting us to follow him, guess what we find ourselves doing? We have a deep, deep concern with those who are living life without Jesus. And so we're to go on mission with Jesus. The great thing is he's already at work. We get to join Jesus in what he is already doing. If we have eyes to see and a heart to, to follow him, we can share Jesus with another person. Uh, making disciples of, of the nations, and this nation is why we're here. And although it's easy to lose sight of this, it has to remain the thing, the, the pri primary thing, because it's the very purpose of our church together. Um, we, we've come up, you know, years ago with an acrostic that just helps us to keep this sharing Jesus with another person, to keep it in the forefront of our mind, and to remind us of our um, part in what God is doing in the world. Uh, maybe you've seen this before, but we, the acrostic is blessed, and yes, it's misspelled on purpose, Okay. But the, the B in blessed says begin with prayer. Begin with prayer. And I want to encourage you as you develop the prayer habit to also be praying for people you know and love to come to know and love Jesus. 
I'm not going to go through the rest of the acrostic. If you go to info.narkenzie.net, we put a link there where you, because maybe you're here and you're like, well, what's the L? And the E, and why isn't there another E? Uh, you can go to info.narkenzie.net, click the link, and you can read about the whole acrostic. But I just want you to know that the way we begin is with prayer. The B stands begin with prayer. And it could be that sharing Jesus with another person is such a, you know that it's the right thing. You know that it's why we exist, but it's such a, uh, just a block. And it could be a block in your development as, a, as someone following Jesus. He did say to the first disciples, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. When we begin with prayer, of course, we're praying for our coworkers or our family members, our neighbors. We're praying for them. And, but maybe we need to begin the year by beginning in prayer for ourselves. And maybe the prayer is just, Lord, give me eyes to see. Give me a heart that is willing to stop my agenda for the day and to you know, listen to this person. Help me have the kind of hospitality that you had, the love that you had, even just to share a meal with them or to, to serve them, right, unconditionally. So I see a need, Lord, would you help me when I see a need, not to hesitate, but to step into that need. And I have brothers and sisters around me, if it's a bigger need, we can, we can bind together, we can help that person. And they don't know you yet, but I pray that my ministry, my serving them, would help them see you. Maybe that's, we need to pray for ourselves. You see, we think that sharing Jesus with another person, we think that the first step is to talk and that's why we're so afraid. And I want to remind you today, begin with prayer. Yes, I want you to talk, but I want you to talk to God about your own heart and willingness to share Jesus with others and pray for those people. Talk to, your, talk to God about your neighbor before you talk to your neighbor about God, right? Pray, begin with prayer. I will give you the second S. The second S is to share your story. You see, there is a place for talking. It's not like we never do, you know, give witness. Uh, Peter, you know, wrote uh, to always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. So we, there is a place where we will speak and be a witness for Jesus. But it's not until the second S. It's so, there's so many other things that we can do before we actually have to use words. We will use words, but there's so many other things that help people see Jesus and come to know and follow him. So begin with prayer. Share Jesus with someone and be begin to pray. I mentioned that, you know, we can uh, kind of rally together to love people and to serve people. That's actually our mission statement. You know, you see it written around in different places. Uh, we talk about together as family, we are loving others to Jesus. Do you know why we say it this way? Together, as the Norkenzie family, we are loving others to Jesus because you know, the big Bible word is evangelism. You know, evangelism is not a solo act. Loving people to Jesus is a team sport. And you and I, we are not alone. We are not alone. We're together as family. And together, our witness is Christ. And we will love people uh, uh, together. By the way, if you're a guest here today, I just want you to know, I, you know, it's like they're talking about me. I just want you to know this is so important to us as a people and as followers of Jesus that we do talk about it. We do talk about it. And if you're not yet following Jesus, please give me grace in this moment. But just know how important it is to us that you and, and everyone who doesn't yet know Christ actually come to know him and to be loved by him you know, together as family, we're loving others to Jesus. Part of it is our gathering. You know, we're, all, we're pretty sensitive in these moments to be, to be clear and to be welcoming. And so that you, as a member of this church family, you don't have any hesitation. I can invite my, my cousin to church with me. When, when things are going sideways for my neighbor or my coworker, I can say, hey, invite, invite them to come to church with me and know that we're going to, you know, proclaim the gospel. We're going to love people. And it's a safe place. This is how we're doing it together. Because it's not just on you. It's not a solo 
effort. It's a team sport, and we are doing it together. That's why this, I mentioned at the beginning, this shell is not for you, except it is for you. If you're a member of the, the family here, this shell is for you, because when you're talking with your friend or family member, you, get, you can use this. You can use this to help them see Jesus and to know what, what Narkenzi's about, what the kingdom of heaven is like, and lead them as you pray for them to come to know, know, know him. So uh, I would just encourage you in the new year, maybe this is your step. It needs to be all of our steps. There's people in our lives who don't know Christ, and let's set out to share the love of Jesus with them. Let's share the love of Christ with them. So of these five steps, you know, the sixth one I'll mention, I'll give you a sixth one. It's one that I'll end with next week. And that is um, a step that we all need to take is to help other people take these steps. God calls all of us to help one another take these steps and if you're a little nervous, it's like, I don't know about any of this. I, just, I would bring you back to the greatest commandment, the second one that's like it. If you put these next steps or any that God may give you in the next 24 hours, here's what I want you to do. If you put a next step or a few next steps through the filter of the greatest commandment, you'll be just fine. Because when the question came, you know, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you put these next steps through that filter, like, should I develop a prayer habit? Well, is that a demonstration of loving God? Yes. In fact, it's not just loving God. It's loving your neighbor, and it's loving yourself. If you become a person of God's word and a person of prayer, you are loving God, but you are also loving the people around you. For some of us, what the people around us in our homes and in our workplaces, what the people around us need is for us to follow Jesus. Because us not following Jesus is not very pretty. It's challenging. It's difficult. But if we would grow this next year, become more like him, we would, that would be an expression of loving your neighbor. Loving your family is focusing your heart and your mind on Jesus. Jesus is in motion. He is moving in this world. His kingdom is advancing, and he says to us, come follow me. My friends, there are next steps. He has next steps for you and for me. We want to go into a time of prayer and just want to encourage you in, in the stillness of these few moments to seek God about these things. What, what would he have you do? What would be the single best next step that the Holy Spirit would say, do this in following me? And it might lead you to a whole new way of following him, a whole new life in Christ. But in these moments, talk with the Lord what next steps would he invite you to take? Let's pray.